Welcome to a Word for Today Bible teaching, which is brought to you by My Cornerstone Church right here in Bryson City. Well, go ahead and get a pencil and a piece of paper if you'd like to take notes as the scriptures instruct us to be a Berean of the Word. Uh, Jesus had been going through, uh, he had left the upper room and he was now headed through Jerusalem. He was headed over to the Mount of Olives, and there about halfway up on the Mount of Olives was the Garden of Gethsemane. We said this was Passover time, and Jesus was leading the disciples from one area to another. And as Jesus was going along the route, he had been sharing some truths to his disciples. Uh, we're in John chapter 16, but we had talked about in a couple of previous chapters, Jesus had given him, uh, given the disciples instructions as how they were to live their lives. He was instructing them in such ways that if they wanted to bear fruit in their lives, they would have to remain or they would have to stay close to him. In other words, on their own, apart from him, they could not bear any fruit that would last, that it was only by remaining close to the Lord Jesus Christ would they have success and bearing fruit uh, with any meaning. Then he went on to tell them that they were to love one another just as the Father had loved the Son. Jesus had just got through sharing with his disciples that he was getting ready to depart and return to the Father, the Father that had sent him. Now, if they were going to be able to get along with each other, they had to start loving one another. Then Jesus went on to warn them about the hatred of the world. He says, if they hated me, and yet they've seen all the miracles that I have done, how much more will they hate you? So Jesus was preparing the disciples about things that were to come. Now, we're going to see in John chapter 16, Jesus knows that he's getting ready to die. He's in less than 24 hours. He would be going to the cross. And when his disciples, he's, he was instructing them that when they were going to be faced with that reality, uh, Jesus responds to their concerns by talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the name of today's message is, Be of Good Cheer. So go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 16. And we're going to pick it up in verse 5. Jesus said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So here we see there seems to express disappointment that the disciples were not interested in what laid ahead for the Lord. Although they had asked in a general way where he was going, but they had not seemed to be too involved. They appeared to be more interested in their own future than with Jesus. And before Jesus laid the cross in the grave and before, uh, before them lay persecution for their service, that they were to be doing unto the Lord. So in other words, they were filled with sorrow over their own troubles rather than over his. But nevertheless, <laughs> they would not be left without help and without comfort. Now let's look at John 16 verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he... When he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Verse 9, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, Jesus was going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And notice what it says. He was going to send the Holy Spirit to them to be their helper. It's important to note that the Spirit comes to the church. It's coming to these disciples. 
It comes to the body of believers. The Holy Spirit does not come to the world, but in one way, and I'll go over that in a few minutes. This means that the Holy Spirit works in and through the church, my friend. That If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to reside in you, and you're going to fulfill my work that I have done, started here on earth. But keep in mind that it would be to the advantage of the disciples that the helper should come. And Jesus explains the benefits of his departure right through here. And by Jesus leaving, the counselor, the Holy Spirit would come. Now, when Jesus was on earth, think about this, my friend. When Jesus was on earth, he was in an earthly body. He could only be present in one place at a time. In other words could only be geographically one place at a time doing the ministry that the Father had for him to do. But the Holy Spirit would come. He would indwell all believers everywhere in the world at one time. Now, I want to share something with you. If you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. He resides in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, my friend, what that means is whenever you get up and leave today, the Holy Spirit goes with you. Whenever you get up tomorrow morning, go to work, go to the ball field, go do whatever it is you do, the Holy Spirit's with you as you go throughout. Now, I want to go through this, and there's going to be three aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, if you've got a pencil and piece of paper, jot, jot this down. Number one is conviction of the world. There in verse 8. He was talking about conviction of the world. Now, in the life of you and I, before we accepted Christ as our Savior, the primary purpose of the ministry of the Holy Spirit was to convict us. Now, I'm talking about in the life of an unbeliever, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to come and convict you. And was he convict us of? The failure to believe in Christ. In other words, the Holy Spirit will show your weaknings and my weaknings. It will reveal to us that we cannot do life alone, that we need someone much greater. We need a Savior. We need, a, we need the Lord in our lives. So that is the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, listen to this. And the second thing, then after you and I accept Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to minister to the redeemed. In other words, is to convince you and I that you are righteous. Not because of yourself, because of the righteousness of Him. Amen? Now, over in 2 Corinthians, let me just turn right over there. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, in verse 21. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become right the righteousness of God in him think about that my friend it's not anything that you've done it's not anything that I've done but you and I will be considered righteous only because of what Jesus Christ has done now the third thing right through here it says right through here in verse 11 it says that is to convict to convict the world of righteousness in other words the Holy Spirit comes to convince the world of judgment. And he says, because the ruler of this world is judge. The judgment, my friend, is on Satan and those who follow him. So he said, number one, it was to come and convict us of our sin. Number two, the Holy Spirit is to show you and I, those that have accepted Christ, how we're to live our lives. How does he do this, my friend? Through the Word of God, through his scriptures. And the third thing that the Holy Spirit does, it convinces the world. It lets the whole world know that you've already been judged. And my friend, the only way that you can get out of that judgment is if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus was sharing this with the disciples, but then the helper would not come unless Jesus went back to the Father. In other words, he had to return to heaven and be glorified. Now, something that we need to keep in mind, remember the Holy Spirit had been in the world before. He was going to be coming in a new way, my friends. 
He would help the disciples to remember things. Because right there in verse 12, it says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, the Holy Spirit is going to share with these disciples, share with believers such as you and I, the things of God. How many times have you picked up something and you read it and you thought, well, I didn't remember any of that. Then all of a sudden, a short time or possibly a long time later, somebody gets to talking about that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit brings up right back to your remembrance amen good now number one the ministry of the holy spirit is conviction as we've been going over now the second ministry of the holy spirit is communication look at verse 13 john chapter 16 verse 13 it says but when he the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So we see right through here that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to communicate it. Now, Jesus never acted on his own initiative, but only in obedience to the Father. Now, the work which the Lord begun was to be continued by the Spirit of truth. I want us to notice he will guide you, as it says here in the scriptures, but he will not control you. My friend, you and I have that free will that we can accept to be obedient or be disobedient. But if you and I want to do the work of the Lord, we need to come into obedience and remain in him. Now, this is a, a sense in which all truth was committed to the apostles in their lifetime. Then they in turn, they took this truth that was shared with them and they committed it to writing. That's how we had the New Testament today. This, then you take this New Testament and add it to the, no, uh, the Old Testament, which completed God's written revelation to man. Now, as we know, this is true of all ages, that the Spirit guides people into all truth. Now, the principal work of the Holy Spirit will be to glorify Christ. Any other way will not be in harmony with the Spirit's purpose. Now, Jesus knew that this was going to be extremely difficult for the disciples to understand. And the way we know this is because Jesus had just said, Sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus said, But nevertheless, which means despite of all that, he wanted them to trust in something that they did not understand. Jesus wanted the disciples, just as he wants you and I know today, that he has a plan. So the first ministry of the Holy Spirit is conviction. The second ministry of the Holy Spirit is communication. Now the third aspect of the ministry is revelation. Look at verse 16. A little while... And you will no longer behold me. And again a little while you will see me. Some of his disciples, uh, some of his disciples therefore said to one another, What is this thing that he is telling us? A little while and you will not behold me. And again in a little while you will see me. And because I go to the Father. Verse 18. And so they were saying, What is this? That he says a little while. We do not know what he's talking about. In verse 19. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them. Are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while. And you will, and you will not be behold me. And again in a little while you will see me. Truly truly I say to you. That you will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. 
Verse 21, whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for that joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too now have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one takes your joy away from you. Now, my friends, this is a very, very important part of Scripture. He's saying that your sorrow is going to be turned to joy. Now, with Jesus' words, a little while, uh, it was very, very confusing to the disciples. He said, you would not see me in a little while, then in a little while, you would see me. They could not reconcile these statements. But Jesus, oh, my friend, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, didn't answer their question directly, but he gave information on the statement. He says, in a little while, the world would rejoice. Now, why would the world rejoice? Because they were successful in crucifying him. But he said the disciples would weep there in verse 19. But Jesus knew that the sorrow, oh, my friend, he knew that the sorrow would only be for a very short while. Their sorrow would be turned to joy. And how would their sorrow be uh, turned into joy? Number one is by the resurrection. That would be proof. Keep in mind, many, many gods claim to be God. Then all of a sudden they died, then you see them no more. But Jesus, he had told the disciples that he would be crucified, but on the third day he would be risen. And my friends, this is what's going to give them joy on that, that third day when they went out to the grave and Jesus wasn't there. Then he appeared to the ladies and he went to the house where the other disciples were. If we notice, it turned their sorrow into joy. They knew then, they knew then that Jesus was God. Because he is the only person that had ever resurrected from the dead and remained alive. Now, there had been other resurrections, but they eventually died and, and went on. But Jesus was the only one in the scriptures that had risen and remained alive. So that was the first uh, way that their sorrow would be turned to joy. Now, the second way, keep in mind, they're going to be grieved. Jesus is going to be going away. But the second way that their sorrow is going to be uh, turned into joy is by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, this would happen, and then the disciples, they would forget their sorrow, just as a mother forgets her labor pain after the child is born. But look at verse 23, John chapter 16, verse 23, and in that day, you will ask me no question. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you shall ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. Verse 24, until now you have asked for nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Now these things I have spoken to you in a figurative language. An hour is coming when I will speak no more to you in a figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. Verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request the Father on your behalf. Notice he says, I do not say to you that I will request. But look at verse 27, for the Father himself loves you, because you love me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world, and I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. Jesus was saying here that we just need to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus, he promises a greater joy regarding uh, their coming access to God. After his departure, amen, the day was going to come when Jesus would not be with them to answer all their questions and all their requests. He would not be with them in a bodily form. So what would they do now? In that day, it would be their privilege to ask the Father. He would grant their request for Jesus' sake. Now, our request would be granted not because we are worthy. Oh, my friends. But it's because the Lord Jesus is worthy. Amen. Up until now, they had not prayed to God the Father in the Lord's name. But now they're invited to ask. Ask in the name of Jesus. And through answer prayer, their joy would be fulfilled. 
Men, there is nothing greater in life. The first greatness is when you accept Christ into your life. And then as you live that Christian life and you start praying in the name of Jesus that the Lord God would answer your prayers and all of a sudden you see him answer your prayer. Oh, my friend, how many of y'all have ever been down with the sickness? Maybe short on cash, whatever the case may be. You pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And then whenever you see the father answer your prayers, my friend, then you will see that joy, uh, that sorrow turned into a joy. I know in my own life, I've seen it many, many times. <coughs> now, through answer prayer, their joy will be fulfilled. Now, we must remember that the Father loved the disciples. Why did they love them? Because they had received His Son, Jesus. They had loved Jesus, and they believed in Jesus and His deity. Now, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, they would enjoy a new sense of intimacy with the Father. They would be able to approach God with confidence, and all because they had loved his son, Jesus. What a promise, my friend, that you and I have. When we love the Lord Jesus, we can enter into the presence of God with confidence. Knowing that when we pray in the name of Jesus, if it's according to the Father's will, and that's very important for us to remember, that when you and I pray in the name of Jesus, our will lines up with his will then the Father will answer our prayers. Oh, that's joy, my friend. Now look at verse 29. John chapter 16, verse 29. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered him, do you now believe? Verse 32. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone, and yet I am not alone. Why? Because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Now in the new, I usually read out the new King James. It says, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. So here we see Jesus is talking about tribulation, but along with that can come peace. The disciples thought that they were now able under to understand Jesus for the first time. He was no longer using that figurative speech. And Jesus knew that they loved and they trusted him. But did they really know that he was God manifested in the flesh? Did they really understand? Now, Jesus loved these men for what they were with full knowledge of their shortcomings. My friend, here is something I believe that is a great nugget for you and I. Jesus loved his disciples, even knowing that they were going to betray him in one way or another. He knew that in just a short while that he was going to be arrested and tried and crucifixed, that the disciples would all forsake him and return to their homes. But Jesus says, even though you're going to do those things, I'm not going to be alone. He said, for the Father is going to be with me. It was a union with God the Father that they didn't still quite understand. Although they would, but as of now they don't. Now, the purpose of Jesus sharing this with the disciples would, would be that they could have peace while they were going to go through. Now, what are the disciples getting ready to face? Let me share with you, my friends. They're getting ready to, to be hated by other people. They're getting ready to be pursued. They're getting ready to be persecuted. They're going to be falsely accused, even tortured. How could they have peace Going through this difficulty, my friend, the same way that you and I can have peace when maybe we're having uh, family problems, maybe we're having problems at our job or in our school or, or maybe in a club that we belong to. Jesus is saying to you, my friend, and to me, that although you're going through all this tribulation, you can have peace. But here's the key, my friend. The only way that you and I can have peace is in him, in Jesus. 
Jesus overcome the world and he defeated Satan through the cross of Calvary. Now, here's something I want to share with you. The only power that Satan can have over you is the power that you allow him to. Jesus said that Satan has been judged. There in verse 11. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, my friend, that's saying to you and I that the Satan, the devil himself, cannot have any type of authority over you or over me unless, unless we allow him to. Now, what is there today that you're allowing Satan to have power over you. Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? Uh, could it be the internet? How about food? How about loneliness? How about another person? How about not making enough money and that has just really consumed you? Are you allowing Satan to fill your mind with these things? Oh, my friend, you and I need to read that scripture verse. We have to remember Satan has been dethroned. When we as children of God come against Satan in the name of Jesus on the basis of the, of the cross, Satan must yield to the authority of Jesus. Also, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, you have new powers of endurance. You have new courage to face the problems that are coming against you. Do you think that because you become a Christian, you will have no problems? Oh, my friend, if you thought anybody just been a believer for any, uh, it could be a short amount of time, they're going to tell you that there's going to be problems come into your life. I remember one time I was teaching a new believers class, and we usually had quite a few people that attended that class. Well, as I got to talking to people, I did a little survey. Say that there was 30 people in the class, probably 20 or 22 of them, they had accepted Christ years earlier. And then they became, they became a believer and they thought that once they accepted Christ as their Savior, they would no longer have any problems. And then when the Satan come in and started reminding them of their past or beating them up in other areas, they said, well, I thought I wasn't going to have these problems. And then all of a sudden they got discouraged and they walked away from the faith and they went back out into the world. My friends, when a person does that, when they tasted the truth and they go back out into the world, the scripture said it's going to be seven times worse once they go back out. So they go back out and then they realize that, you know what, this is no life at all. Then they come back into the faith. So my friends... Let me encourage you, if you're new to the faith, let me encourage you, get into the Word of God. Find somebody where you worship at. Get discipled by a little bit stronger believer. And my friends, if you're a stronger be believer, look for somebody new to the faith to disciple them, to mentor them. But notice, I want us to catch a hold of something. Notice in verse 33, uh, Jesus didn't promise peace, but he offered it. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me... Notice where? Notice where you're going to get the peace in Him. You may have peace. He says He didn't promise peace, but here's the thing. He offered it. He said you may have peace. A person can follow Jesus, yet deny themselves of that peace. Notice what I said. We gain the peace that Jesus offered by finding it in Him. Jesus said that in me, you may have peace. Hey, my friend, we won't find peace anywhere else other than Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that we won't have tribulations. Jesus gave the promise of tribulations. So many Christians, they don't understand the promise of tribulation. They think that, hey, there's not going to be any more struggles. Well, my friend, that's not the way life is. We're always going to have struggles in life. Your current area of struggle may one day pass away but after that guess what there's going to be new territory that you're going to, have to conquer for the lord i heard somebody say that every 21 days either you're right in the, getting ready to start a storm or you're right in the middle of a storm or you're just getting out of a storm now let's say that you're just getting out of the storm guess what you hold on real quick you hold on you're going to get ready to go into another battle again it's just the facts of life, and that's the way it is. But Jesus is telling us, listen to what he's telling us. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. This was an amazing comment from a man who was about to be arrested. He was about to be forsaken. He was about to be rejected, mocked, tortured, executed. 
Here, my friend, Jesus was setting the example for you and I. Knowing that we're getting ready to face something that we may not want to face. But my friend, he's telling us right through here. That he has overcome the world. And he brings us, you and I, other believers, good cheer. It's the foundation for our peace that is found in him. We see that Jesus is in control. We see him, although he leaves, he does not abandon. We see that he loves and he sees the victory in his children, my friend. So therefore, with that said, you and I can be of good cheer. Amen? Good. Well, this is going to conclude today's message. If you have any questions or comments, you may call me. You can call uh, Pastor Bill, area code 828-488-0445. Again, my name is Pastor Bill. My phone number is 828-488-0445. Or you may go to our website. And, and look at it. And we have all the teachings on the website. And you can just go on and scroll down and look for teachings and click it on. Now, the website address is www.mycornerstonebc.com. Again, www.mycornerstonebc.com. Now, until we open the word together again, my friends... May the Lord bless you, keep you, and may his face shine upon you. Amen.